Well, I guess we can get started. Welcome everyone uh, to this session on uh, most important thing we should be thinking about education. Uh, Rick Hanischek is going to present. His colleague is with us as well. He disappeared from the screen. I guess he'll come back. Oh, there's Ludger. Uh, welcome. Um, the title of the paper is The Economic Impacts of uh, Learning Loss. Um, it's a very important topic uh, that we're all facing, uh, whether we have kids or grandkids or thinking about the future. So um, why don't you just get started, Rick? We're, we're gonna have, uh, it's being recorded, which uh, Rick has agreed to. And uh, if you wanna raise your hand, a mechanical hand or uh, the chat function, we'll be watching. Uh, Rick will entertain questions throughout, so that's okay. And I'm going to get off a little early uh, to do another Zoom in another location. I'm going to sit in the same chair, but John Cochran is going to take over at that point. Who knows when it'll be, but uh, it'll be great. So, Rick, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thanks, John. The talk today is one of that I find very frustrating because there has been so little attention to the learning losses and what those imply for economics in all of the recent uh, um, discussions of schools. You know, <clears throat> there's nobody doubts that there's been a lot of lost learning from the universal school closures last spring and then the um, somewhat chaotic way in which schools have rejoined the schooling world up till now. Uh, we're now on a what I think is looking for like a photo finish in San Francisco of whether they can bring students in before the schools close for the year. And what we're what we've tried to do um, in this work is to get away from just the issues of the logistics of reopening. All of the media attention has been about um, safety of teachers and how much room between desks and air conditioning and so forth with a little bit of a statement in the background that of course we want to get back to schooling as we knew it beforehand. We just have to make sure that it's uh, safe and recognizes the conditions of the pandemic. Because of the chaotic openings around the world, country, we really don't know the full extent of the harm yet. Uh, so we're going to make some estimates. They have a large variance at times, but we can talk about that as we go along. Um, the estimates that we get are large enough that if you think that we've overestimated, just cut them in half and you still get very large numbers. And so that's where we're going here is to try to put some uh, actual dollar values on what has happened in schools as a marker on what we have to overcome if we're not going to uh, leave this current generation in a extremely bad position over their lifetime. So during the last school year, there's been a wide vari variation in what's happened. It's, some of it has been across states where some states have gone back to schooling beforehand. Much of the variation has been within states. We know that in general, private schools have tended to go back to full uh, in-class instruction more quickly than traditional public schools. Same for many charter schools. Um, it's clear that we're better off than we were in the spring of 2020, where we just closed down with no warning. And so schools were unprepared for any uh, technological uh, additions and how to do remote instruction. They presumably worked a bit of that over the summer, but I don't think that they worked out all the bugs completely. And what, what we have now is relatively limited data on what has happened over the 2021 school year. Um, there's been incomplete testing. And in fact, many states and school districts have pleaded not to test anybody 
on the argument that we know it's going to be different than normal and, and worse, so we shouldn't bother to collect any data. And so there's been a lot of resistance even to testing um, where as nobody has argued that you should use test information for any real accountability. It's just that we need to have some data. Here's a, one quick snapshot of what has happened uh, to schools over the last year. So at the beginning of May of this year, we have survey data that suggests what proportion of students were in, doing in-person schooling. That's the green bar. So at the top, you see for all students in the country, roughly half the students in the country were doing in-person schooling. Um, the black mark at the left side is how many were doing fully remote schooling. And that's down to about 2%. And so 48% were doing some mixture of in-person and remote instruction of varying kinds. Uh, now, interestingly, the, the, one of the biggest differences is that um, districts that elected uh, or voted for Donald Trump in the last elections are much more likely to have in-person instruction than districts that voted uh, for President Biden, uh, which is down to just a little over 30% in Biden districts and over six, around 60% for Trump districts. The other big difference you see actually is that um, majority black school districts where the majority of the students are black um, has had much less in-person instruction than average. Uh, they're about 40% in-person but they have 8% of students in majority black districts have had fully remote instruction over the entire year. Um, so this is hinting at one of the things that we're not gonna talk much about today, but is lurking behind everything. The distributional impacts are gonna be huge from all of this uh, remote and hybrid learning that's been going on. We know that there, <coughs> um, this is probably going, it's learning that occurred over this last year is probably going to be more closely related to family background than it is normally. It's normally very related um, because some uh, better off families both know how to uh, give ac added instruction at home. They're more prepared to push their kids to actually be learning. They provide uh, various kinds of learning experiences that are undoubtedly superior to what disadvantaged kids have been getting. And so one of the things we're gonna see um, if we go back to, to normal classes in the fall of this year, we're gonna see much wider variations in the starting achievement level of kids. But that, that those wider variations are also going to play out into the future. So what I'm gonna do is give you some estimates of economic losses that pertain to basically the average. But you should recognize that the average is made up of some with much larger learning losses than others and that those learning losses are going to expand on achievement gaps that we see. Rick, uh, could you say a little bit about the private parochial versus public here? Maybe or... Well, they, they, we don't have good data on, um, on this. It's all anecdotal. But uh, what we've seen is that, in general, private schools um, have gone back to in-person instruction much more rapidly than uh, traditional public schools. Um, in terms of large school districts, uh, we actually have uh, limited data on where kids are. Uh, large districts have lost somewhere between five and 10% of their uh, student population from last year that you'd expect. A, a portion of that is going into charter schools. A portion of that is going into private schools. 
a portion is doing some sort of in in home um, uh, instruction, home uh, based instruction, and a portion of of that five to 10% are just feral as far as we can tell. Um, so there has been this increasing disparity, I think, of what we've seen in the reactions of school districts uh, to the uh, pandemic. Rick, could, could I ask um, how much of your Trump, Biden and, and black, non-black is um, large urban inner city suburb versus rural? Which uh, you see a little bit of that in the, if you go down the, to the third block there below all, you have districts by whether they have three to five schools, six to 11 schools and 12 plus. Right? Uh, so what you see is that smaller, more suburban rural districts went back to school more frequently, um, bigger green bars for, for those schools than for the um, medium to large districts. So it, it is the case, particularly if you look around California, that um, the large districts have had a terrible time opening up again. Um, and uh, for those of you who are local here, the San Francisco School District um, last week offered seniors the opportunity to return to classes um, they made it explicit that there was no instruction was going to go on. There would be supervision. And what they were hoping to do is get the senior class um, being recorded as attending school. So they got credit for opening their schools and would get some bonus money that uh, the California governor promised for having open schools. Um, and that sort of typifies in some sense the problems that we've had in some of the larger urban districts that have been um, fighting uh, with the, basically between the unions and the districts on whether they could ever open. So let me tell you what I want to do today. I'm going to present some estimates of the economic impacts of the closures. Um, what we're, I'm going to do is divide that up into basically the full closure period, which was last March uh, through last summer, and then try to update that to today. Uh, the estimates for the full closure period are clearer than, and probably more precise than those for today, in part because we have limited uh, actual data on the, what's happened in the last year, and there's a lot more variation across uh, states and districts. But I'll Rick, give you Rick, can I ask just very quick, what's the sample size on that first bar chart? How many schools re are represented there? Um, you've got um, uh, that sample covers districts, all of the districts with, I think, over 300 kids in them. Um, oh, so, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's a sample of, it comes from a sample of districts. So that's, a, there's no no variance there. Um, and then we'll talk uh, in any remaining time about what I would see as some policy options um, based upon the economic costs that we have today. This work um, uh, is based upon some estimates that Ludger Woosman and I made uh, last summer uh, in August of 2020. We were asked by the OECD to provide some estimates of learning losses for the G20 meetings that were held last November. Um, and so what we did was to make a series of estimates based on, on our best knowledge over the summer of what the learning losses were, and then presuming that schools returned to their prior level in September of 2020 which they obviously haven't. Um, and so that's, I'll, I'll break these estimates up into two parts because the uh, estimates for the first part of this are clearer than the estimates for the second part. Um, so what do, what do we do? So what we're trying to do is take data on what actual achievement looks like versus what you call historical expectations. So if we have an expectation of where 
the average fifth grader would be prior to the pandemic, and then we get some actual achievement data, the, uh, what we call the lost learning is the difference between what we see or what we think we see and the historical expectations for learning. And so we get an estimate of uh, <clears throat> lost achievement. And then we um, uh, apply those first to um, individual uh, earnings estimates based upon labor market returns to achievement. Um, and then we'll go to some aggregate estimates based upon growth models that Ludger and I have estimated over time that relate achievement of the population to, in fact, the growth rates, long run growth rates of countries um, and, and then play through those. So that's what we're at about trying to do. Let me go through the estimates we have. As I said, they're in two parts. One is start, we'll talk a little bit about individual returns. Um, and what we're gonna do is estimate what looks like a sort of a standard mincer earnings model where we uh, relate log of earnings of people to A, which is achievement, potential experience and potential experience squared, which is basically age and out, time out of school in an error term. Sort of a standard mincer equation, except we're gonna base things on what people know is measured by achievement as opposed to just years of schooling. Now, what makes this possible is that um, the OECD uh, fairly recently in uh, 2012 and 13, uh, did a, a really interesting survey across countries. What they did was go out and get a representative sample of the working age population, age 15 to 65 in, in individual countries um, and uh, found out a lot about where people were at different ages in terms of their earnings and their uh, experiences and so forth. And interestingly, they also gave them an achievement test. So they went out and gave people a math and reading test at different ages. So you have a cross section of individuals uh, for each country where you know something about their experiences, you know their achievement and you know their earnings. And so um, some work that Ludger and um, Guido Schwert um, and Simone Wiederhold uh, and I did uh, using these data, uh, tried to estimate what's the return to skills for the average worker in uh, society. And so we're gonna take our estimate of alpha, which relates achievement based in standard deviations to earnings. So alpha will be essentially a, um, how, what proportion higher will your earnings be if you know more? That, that's what alpha is. So here's what you get when you look across countries. Sorry, Ricky, can I ask a quick question about the specification? So you, you sure. said that you're, you're going to talk about the average uh, students, but I was thinking about all these debates about the fact that kids are different. And so we typically think about this wage equation within a mixture setup. We think that some parameters are observably differ across individuals. And so um, is it something that, that you're worrying about? Are you able to talk about Will you be talking at all about any form of heterogeneity returns that may yeah. feed back into the size of the loss? Estimates? Well, I'm not going to. Uh, no, I'm not going to talk at all about that, uh, Elena. This is this is something we we spent a lot of time in this paper looking at some differences in the returns and so forth, and and how that interacts across industries and people and so forth. But what we're Presuming is that when people estimate mints or earnings equations, um, they say there's a lot of heterogeneity. Uh, we think that we actually measure a fair amount of that heterogeneity because we've actually tested the skills of individuals and not um, relied on just years of schooling. But that a lot of that is people with um, a high school degree 
actually have quite different skills and we're measuring those. But that doesn't go as far as you want or as we would want. And so um, whenever I give you an average estimate, it's based upon their, their actual skills here, but there's a lot of variation in, behind that. Um, and I'll wave my hands and you can put in any number you want. But in our, in our old paper, just to, to add to that, and we looked at quite a bit of heterogeneity in returns and really across observable categories, there's really not much. So we, so we know, for example, whether people's parents had a university degree, so you know a little bit about the family background and so on. And the return was pretty stable. I mean, it's like, it's really that it's at most 10%, uh, not percentage points, percent that varies across subgroups of the population. So I don't think that the heterogeneity in returns to skills is super large in here. I guess what we more think about is heterogeneity in the in terms of the learning losses. So how big, I get, uh, right, Nadelger. I think one question is how you interpret the why. What measure of outcome, labor market outcome, along which they mentioned you measure returns and the Ministry of Recreation is some corner labors uh, yeah. criticized because we don't have information about firms that matter for the type of returns that you have. And so including latent classes of individuals is a way to capture the fact that individuals are better at finding jobs at high productivity firms and all the things that you also know. But this is just, I guess if the comment is if you're looking at returns over a very narrow window upon entering the labor market, or I don't know what why is you're thinking of, then the concern I have are less pronounced. There are people that submit earnings regressions for individuals 20 years out in the labor market, and then all the considerations have in mind, I think are more uh, yeah, so salient. We, we spent a lot of time about this. Actually, when we actually estimate alpha, we're actually looking at people that are 35 to 60 um, because of lots of variation at the beginning of lifetime and so forth. But let, uh, we can come back to that if we have time at the end. There's, a, um, uh, there's this paper and Ludger and, and um, others have a follow-on paper to this um, and we can talk about details. Uh, but, but what we've tried to do is just take the, our best estimate of why here is um, uh, annual income of people and uh, we're estimating alpha. I would, I would submit that, that, that Rick gets more from his MIT PhD than the average guy. <laughs> yes, we don't have that in. We actually didn't have that fully in our data set, Bob. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it, it, there's an interesting pattern uh, across countries. So you see countries on the horizontal axis, the vertical axis is essentially what alpha is. So that um, what you see is that the US is very high in the returns. You know, Singapore and Chile and Israel are a little bit higher. But what this basically says is that one standard deviation higher in achievement is 26% higher income over the lifetime of the person. Um, and so the US has some of the strongest returns to skills of any country in the world. Um, and then coming back to the distributional question uh, and the difference in learning losses, you can read that backwards and say, the US punishes the lack of skills more than almost any country in the world. So that the impact of low skills in the US is much higher than it is down in on the far right end when you get to Greece, which doesn't pay much attention to the skills of people in the, in the labor market compared to at least the US. So what does this imply? What are these after tax and transfer earnings? No, no, no. They're all before tax and transfer. Um, and that, that actually gets into some of the cal calculations. You can do other things with the Scandinavian countries and so forth that um, are concerned of how to actually count all that. Um, so this is all before. So what, what do you get? Um, so what we did was take our best estimates of learning losses over this closure period. This is last August. 
And our best estimate is that you could think if we translated this into school year equivalents, just to make it easier to talk about, nobody likes to talk about standard deviations of achievement or something, but roughly think of the average student lost a third of a year uh, of learning because of the pandemic closures last year. What that says is that the average student in K to 12 education um, during the closure period could be expected to have 3% lower income over their lifetime compared to a student that went through without the, um, the pandemic closures. So it's a, it's a noticeable hit. Um, you know, and there's uh, almost certainly some variation within age groups and so forth of schooling, but on average, it's a 3% loss. Now, over the last year, as you see, only half the students are back to in-class learning now. Um, the best May estimates that I would give are probably somewhere in the range of six to nine percent. That um, the average student who has been out of school in March and then went back to some sort of hybrid learning and maybe in-class learning since then um, has lost essentially two thirds to one year uh, or schooling year equivalents or six to nine percent of their lifetime earnings. Now our estimates, we'll come back to this later on, our estimates are that this is a permanent loss. That unless we change what the characteristics of schools are, the character of schooling, this is what everybody in school today can expect. Now this doesn't apply to kids of Stanford faculty who are there teaching their kids uh, over their shoulders all through the last year and trying to make sure that they're doing the right things. Um, in fact, you know, some of the kids of Stanford faculty might have done better because the Stanford faculty is teaching them as opposed to the regular teachers. But um, <clears throat> on average, this is a huge impact uh, that we can expect to be permanent for this cohort of students. Can you tell me whether or not this is a dead loss or is this uh, a loss to others who didn't suffer this year, such as people who were had graduated or people who are uh, yet to enter school? And is this just a transfer or is this a dead loss? This is a dead loss, I think, with that these people will have less skills and skills are heavily rewarded in the labor market. Um, now they will earn less than the cohort, noticeably less than the cohort that got out of school right before the pandemic. And they will uh, presumably earn less than those that uh, come in after the pandemic is over. Uh, but this is, I don't think it's right to think of this as a transfer. I think they, we have a less skilled society coming out of the pandemic and the individuals who are the least skilled because of the uh, pandemic are going to suffer the most. Rick, is, is anyone talking about that these people should stay in school a little longer? It's a way to solve sure. it. Sure, but that, that doesn't change the loss. Right, because you have to make, make the, well, you're, these you're, individuals can make they make up for it in absolute income, but they've lost right. uh, six to nine percent over what they would get had they stayed in school longer without the pandemic. Um, now, Rick, Rick, I have a question about sort of the education system here. Um, my German friends who have kids in Swiss schools tell me that Swiss schools in early years is pretty easy and not as tough as German schools. And that this used to bother them, but then they realized that basically the Swiss kids catch up in after, I don't know, fourth or fifth grade. So what I'm wondering here about these kids in let's say the earliest grades that have lost time in school, is it, un uh, is it unreasonable to expect that they will catch up? Um, when as they progress in higher 
uh, grades that uh, this they lost some time now, but uh, that they have the ability, like Swiss kids, right. to then uh, learn quickly and catch up. Well, we we have our German expert also as a co-author of this paper, but um, uh, without speaking to Switzerland, let me come back to that later, Ken, okay. because what the, what were um, <clears throat> our our estimates are that these are permanent losses to them and that they're not going to catch up. The head of the American Federation of Teachers, Randy Weingarten, said, oh, kids are resilient and they'll, it doesn't matter. But that means it doesn't matter if they're going to school with, with her teachers either. If, if we go back to what the schools we had, uh, we see no evidence in a, uh, that they'll catch up automatically. And we'll give you some evidence that they don't of other experiences in just a little bit. Rick, this is Terry. Uh, can you use these data to say anything about income distribution over time? Yeah, we, we could. We haven't done that, um, in part because we don't have really good estimates of the um, increased variation in learning that comes out of this. Um, so I, my, my thoughts are that this is going to lead to an expansion of the income distribution, a widening. Um, but uh, we don't have good data to actually do any real estimates of that. Okay, so I- um, I was gonna ask you, sorry, Rick, another quick question. Sure. There's lots of evidence, I mean, your work and Jim Hackman's work that is not intertemporally substitutable investment and not, in addition to being highly dynamic complementary. So the idea that you're missing a stage at some point early on, going back to John's point, there's plenty of evidence that it's nearly impossible to catch up any later on. So is it something that you're, you're able to measure or shed lights on that it's true you're saying maybe it's an overestimate maybe in light of this this technological features of the human capital investment at early ages maybe it's not even an overestimate yours so it's picking up on uh, in part on the sort of dynamic complementarity or whatever um jim wants to call it these days that that probably early learning is um has a bigger impact. So if you were locked out of school when you were supposed to do fractions, you, you probably have trouble when you get to algebra one. And um, whereas later on, it may not be as serious, but um, we're, ju we're just giving you the broad picture here. And there are details that are going to be important, no doubt about it. Well, let me let me go on now that I've got the juices warmed up here of people that are interested in the topic. Um, to, to me, six to nine percent lost income is serious enough that we ought to be doing something about it and at least acknowledging it. Let me let me go to the um, aggregate estimates. Um, this plays off some of the work that. Ludger and I have done on economic growth and how long run growth is a function of the skills of the population. Um, our estimate is <coughs> that essentially the only thing that matters is the skills of the population in terms of long run growth, but we can uh, have some debates about that. What, what we've done is estimate models that relate growth, G, to average achievement uh, in the population, which we're gonna measure with test scores, um, average years of schooling, although that doesn't really matter once you have achievement levels and initial income levels in 1960. So we estimated models like this uh, for the average growth rates in GDP per capita from 1960 to 2000. Um, <clears throat> Why we say that this is the, all that matters is that this equation explains three quarters of the variation across countries in annual growth rates over the in long run growth rates. Um, so 
there's another quarter out there that we can look for, but uh, basically um, average achievement is a good measure of skills. And you get to average achievement, I should just mention, since 1965, um, there have been a series of international tests of skills. So you can think of this as taking a math problem and marching it around the world and seeing how many people can answer this math problem in different countries. And you, out of that, you get a measure of the skills of the different countries. Um, and then what we, when wait, we wait, estimate- Rick, before you go on. Yeah, sure. you, go ahead, Bob. No, no. Um, the, you know, there's a big debate in this in the in this literature about whether growth is the right thing to use on the left hand as the left hand variable. Yeah, and, and I've you know, I've heard of that debate. Yes, right. So, I generally speaking, the the I think the broad consensus is that you shouldn't be looking at the level of on the left hand side and not the growth. What what made you choose growth? Well, we can put this in a level form, and you get much the same answer, actually. We looked at growth because that conceptually, I like it uh, in the sense that I, I think that um, uh, of endogenous growth in some, some broad sense, maybe <clears throat> not in the specifics, that in fact, a more skillful population is better at inventing new things and developing um, uh, uh, new production processes and so forth. But if we, if we estimate, estimate this in level form as um, macroeconomists like to do, um, you get convergence in 150 years or something out of that, of the models that we're estimating. And so we don't think it makes any difference, but we've actually done a huge number of simulations of the difference that you get in terms of future growth um, based upon levels versus um, growth rates. Um, and it makes a difference. So in terms of present value of some education policy, you get two thirds to three quarters uh, the size of the estimates from a level model as opposed to a uh, growth model. So my answer is that um, take my estimates and multiply them by two thirds. And, and then we can be a standard macro level kind of guy. Rick, could I go? <clears throat> yeah. I mean, with, with Y 1960 on the right hand side, levels and growth is almost the same. It's just a question of how you extrapolate it. Yeah. But I wanted to ask a different, now most of the variation in the cross country data is gonna be who achieved catch up growth versus who did not. So I, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure I go with your interpretation of it's about inventiveness. Uh, what you're saying is, you know, South Korea, there's a big growth star and South Korea caught up to the world frontier and had high levels of achievement, but it's not about being inventive. It's about, uh, you know, what, what's the secret sauce to be, um, you know, uh, South Korea and not say parts of Africa that got stuck at the 1960 level as opposed to the leading country and can it innovate? So my R squared is three quarters and por a portion of that comes from Y 1960 and a portion of it comes yeah. from achievement. It turns out that the majority of the difference comes from achievement as we estimate it if you do right. sort of a partial thing. No, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. I'm just saying the mechanism is who does catch up growth and who doesn't as opposed to, uh, you know, is the U.S. Sure. going to have leading country growth from innovation? Uh, sure. Sure, sure, sure. If we, if, we, if we split the sample between, say, OECD countries and non-OECD countries, interestingly, the alpha is basically the same. And so, um, yeah, your point is right. I mean, at any point in time, most countries in the world are catching up. So I, I agree with that. But it's not that it's not visible on, within the countries that do quite a bit of innovation. Well, but, but uh, Germany's GDP is 40% of the U.S.'s. GDP per capita, no, 40% lower than the US's GDP per capita. So there's a, there's a lot of convergence left to happen in the OECD. <laughs> fine. Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. So I, I didn't. I, I, anyway, I, it's I, a small I, point. And, and, and just, it matters for how, how we're going to use this in the simulation. 
just just to reiterate, John, um, Ludger is looking for that catch up growth too. So uh, yeah, catch up growth is good. It's just a question of how you're going to simulate it, which is we'll find out next. Re remember where remember where the um, uh, vaccine came from, though. Uh, um, <clears throat> So what we're going to do uh, um, uh, for our work is, no matter how we estimate this equation with different samples and different measures and so forth, we essentially get alpha as 2.0, which says that one standard deviation difference of country level uh, achievement, not individual, but country level achievement is worth 2% per year in long run growth. Um, and that's what we're going to use to, to simulate uh, what happens into the future. Uh, what we're going to do is basically take and move the affected cohort throughout the century. So we go through a period where the skills of the population goes down relative to what it would have been without a pandemic. It stays down for a while, and then the skills catch back up, presuming that the pandemic ends and we go back to old schools and so forth. And what we've done is just add up what is the impact on uh, growth for the remainder of the century from, in fact, uh, the pandemic and what's hit uh, students. And so um, here's, here's, by the way, the, um, the, the background data. Uh, conditional test scores is uh, this is all from the regression conditioning on income in 1960. Conditional test scores versus conditional average annual growth rate for 60 to 2000. And you see uh, Peru and South Africa down on the left hand corner, and you go up to Singapore and Taiwan and Korea on the top right. Um, and you find the US um, is sort of in the middle. Um, conditional test scores, by the way, I put in um, actual test scores with a, basically a mean of 5,000 for OECD countries, or 500, and a standard deviation of 100 to, to interpret the horizontal axis. So the US um, <clears throat> is in sort of the middle of this picture and does better than you'd expect. Uh, for a variety of reasons that we could talk about, but the U.S. does a bit better than you'd expect, given the skills of our population, at least coming out of school. Um, but here's the, these are the projections we're going to use. The slope of that line is 2.0, um, and that's what we're going to simulate. So in August, um, August of 2020, Again, taking a, a learning loss in school year equivalents. Again, we're doing everything actually in terms of achievement, but just for expositional purposes, say, well, it looks like uh, the closures were a third of a year lost um, uh, schooling. And that looks like on average for the remainder of the century, the GDP is one and a half percent lower than it would have been without the um, pandemic. Uh, so a, a fair amount, if you talk about one and a half percent GDP loss every year into the future. Um, you, you have, you have a, your model depends on one-way causation, right? Absolutely, it does. So, so this literature has, has emphasized that there's two-way causation. Um, yeah, and, okay, so Bobby, do, do, <laughs> Obviously, we, we've spent a lot of time thinking about that. Um, there, there's a very long paper that gives what I would call sort of baseline estimates that these can be interpreted causally. The, the biggest argument about causation has been on models that just use years of schooling as a measure of human capital. And that when you get richer, you buy more of everything, including years of schooling. But it turns out that you don't necessarily buy higher achievement when you have more income. And so we've did uh, we've done a variety of things to try to get at causation. Everything we've done 
could fail for a variety of reasons. Um, but it's unlikely to us that they all fail simultaneously. It's a sort of a monkeys at a keyboard kind of, of question of whether everything in uh, of all of our tests simultaneously fail. But we can talk about that. Um, again, you've already started to multiply these by two thirds, right, Bob? And, and now you can add in a little bit more for causation. So um, maybe take them in half um, <laughs> and, and we'll go with half, okay? So the, the current estimates then um, moving those up uh, given the bad schooling or, or uncertain schooling of the last year, are we're talking about like three to 4% lower GDP for the remainder of the century. So this corresponds to <laughs> on an annual basis to what people have been talking about of the cost of unemployment from the pandemic and business closures and uh, uh, compare favorably to the current Biden Yellen plans for in increasing funding and so forth, this is three to 4% a year lower um, achievement, uh, lower GDP for the remainder of the century, if in fact we don't do anything about the losses that appear to have occurred. So that's, that's what we're talking about, sort of in, in dollar terms, it's somewhere between 25 and $30 trillion of present value loss. If you look at the present value th through the future compared to our estimates of what the world would be if schooling didn't change. So we think- that To a century, here's where levels worth this, extrapolating out a century, levels worth this growth is, is where this might matter, right? Because you're saying there's yeah, a okay. permanent growth rate effect. Again, so, it's, so maybe it's only $20 trillion. On our $21 trillion economy today, uh, we've maybe only lost $20 trillion if in fact we've got the wrong model and it should be in fact all done in levels. Um, so, um, we're, we're willing to take that, um, you know, maybe we should put a, an asterisk there and everybody can sign up for whether they want the, the $20 trillion loss and, uh, or whether they'll accept the 25 to $30 trillion loss. But whatever it is, it's, it just dwarfs all of the current estimates of the cost, what people call the cost of the pandemic, which are unemployment costs and so forth. Um, and don't, don't in fact take into account the, that we will have a less skilled population going into the future. So let me talk a little bit about potentially making up for learning losses. <laughs> um, it, anybody else, um, Bob, final, final um, quibbles about these or not? Uh, are, are we okay with this? It, it, it doesn't say what unit. Is this worldwide or? or US this is or? US dollars, trillions at 27.982 trillion dollars is our present value calculation. In, um, this is actually um, in 2019 dollars. Worldwide, it's going to be worse, and countries. Oh, worldwide, not, it's going to be a lot. Countries that are going to take two and three years off of schooling because they don't have vaccines is going to be worse, and you uh, and and there's also the on the job learning and all that sort of hysteresis stuff, right? So, people who didn't work for a year, well, skills. It's almost certain that that this is going to uh, expand the variance in worldwide income that the poor countries of the world um, are really going to feel the brunt of this. Um, more than just Brazil and um, uh, the equivalents of Brazil. Um, 
Rick, you're not talking about worldwide loss here. You're talking about U.S. loss, right? Yeah, they, these estimates are, are all U.S. losses. Um, there have been some estimates that have been made at the World Bank of worldwide losses, but on different methodology, but you get much larger numbers. Rick, just the, if before we move on, uh, one, one more question about the, uh, the causation. Sorry, there's a weird echo. I don't know if it is on my side. Um, the point that Bob brought up, uh, I thought that here we are in an almost ideal setting in which uh, we have really the canonical diff and diff setup or event study setup because we have different areas that were differentially exposed to the impact of the pandemic because of differential closure policies. And you're tracing out Ceteris Paribus, the impact of the pandemic on learning losses. So all the criticism that one could level against these exercises are minimal in this case, or am I missing something important? No, I think we'll get those data. We don't have those data right now. Basically, we, we don't have really, uh, careful calculations of the learning losses across countries right now, or across states in the US and so forth. But we will get that. Uh, I presume in another year, people will be doing that. Um, that'll be the, the newest round of COVID-19 NBER working papers will be the, exactly that. Rick, Rick can, you, can you reconcile this what seemingly large number with optimal uh, optimal choice by uh, government and individuals. It, it seems like it, there's a big shortfall of future earnings because we're not training people enough. Uh, yeah. I just wonder about that. It, it seems like there's a, there's a first order condition that governs this. Well, I mean, you, you know that the, the, there's been debate about what has gone on in the schooling over the last year. And so we have very different opinions that some states are almost entirely open. Like if you went to Ohio, you would find that almost all the schools are back to in-person instruction. And then you come to California and you find out that they aren't. Um, <clears throat> I don't know, nobody has ever accused um California government of being optimal government policy um so <laughs> I, I, I have to but, but yeah. let's come back I'll just sort of speculate a little bit on um sort of optimal responses to this policy and then we can talk about whether we're likely to see it or not well, um, it, Bob, Bob's question is um the numbers seem to indicate that an extra year of schooling for everybody would have big benefits. Um, I'm not sure that's right or not, but. So I don't think that that's right. I mean, it, from an individual standpoint, I mean, we'll eventually get there. Um, and it's not, it, <clears throat> we'll eventually get there. But I, I'm sort of saying- an individual, for an individual, if you said, well, let's, let's just presume that you didn't get the eighth grade and we'll start you back at the beginning of the eighth grade, they're going to start into the labor market a year later. And so it's an, it's an investment of one year of education. Um, and they might get back to where they were, but with um, S plus one years of time spent out of the labor market to invest in. Well, what I'm getting is sort of a back of the envelope, which makes sense. Um, you, if you go to school for 12 years, then you miss a year of school. That's one twelfth of your income. Uh, and then that, that seems to be basically the number you're saying. If, if on the average, we miss a half a year of school, then one twenty-fourth of income is gone forever. And yeah. that generation, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, no, I think that's, that's right. Um, and there, you know, we might be able to make up for it, but if we, these estimates assume that we go back to um, exactly the schools that we had in uh, January of 20, uh, 2020, um, before the pandemic. Um, and what um, the difference between our August estimates are, we assume that you went back to those schools in September of uh, 2020, which we didn't. 
Um, the current estimates I'm giving you are a little bit uh, uncertain, but uh, they're assuming that we go back to those schools in September of 2021. Now, not even that's clear because if you go to um, some of the discussions you see in the media, you see that uh, schools are saying, well, we hope to be back into operation in the fall, uh, which sounds like we're going to go continue some of this current uncertainty. Heaven forbid summer school. Well, the, the, some have opened up and have made summer school free, which may in fact just expand the income distribution or the achievement distribution that if you look at who volunteers to go back to summer school and, and who doesn't. Rick, just a small point. You also have to think about what's going to be the character of the school, the students when they come back to school. Presumably some kids have parents who've helped them keep up somewhat yeah. and others have just done nothing for a year. So I presume the challenges of teaching a class of heterogeneous students would be a lot worse when they come back. Let me, let me, let me get to that. You're, um, I, I didn't plant Steve in the audience. Let me get back to that uh, in just a second. <laughs> Uh, let's talk a little bit uh, about um, making up for learning losses. What this basically assumes um, is that if you return to 2019, you will not erase the losses. And so coming back to the questions of resiliency, what we do have is, is a number of countries where we've had extended teacher strikes during the year, and then we go back and look at what happened to the kids who were in school during those extended strikes. We have Argentina, of course, is on the list, but Colombia uh, also has lots of teacher strikes. They, um, in the last two decades, or it, it's not quite up to current, um, the average Colombian student lost 74 days of schooling because of teacher strikes or something. Uh, that's something that's hard to, to quite reconcile with, with any reasonable thinking about it. But there are teacher strikes in Belgium also. And when you look at this into the future, you see that these kids have been permanently harmed. They, they stand out in the historical data of the kids that were subject to these experiences in opportunities. Um, Ludger can talk a little bit about this, but in the mid 60s, um, some of the German states had school years that began in, uh, in the winter instead of in the fall in January or February. And they decided to reconcile all that. And they did that by providing some short school years to students. And if you look at them, now or, or into the future, if you look at them in the same data I used for estimating earnings from this longitudinal data, you see that their achievement is less. The, the students in those cohorts uh, at the time have lower achievement than those uh, who didn't have the short school years and that their earnings are less. Um, so that in Germany, they weren't resilient. Um, and then there's been some estimates of what's the impact of long summer school breaks and, and summer learning losses in the US and in Canada. And they all suggest that if you don't have, if you have these extended periods of missed schooling, it shows up in your learning, in your learning and your achievement, and that it subsequently shows up in terms of earnings in the future. Um, now we're already facing limited information about how how large these losses are. So so all of the estimates, I, as I said before, particularly of what's happened over the last year, have a bit of uncertainty attached to them, just because uh, we're not sure who was learning what over the last year. Um, we do know that it's not inevitable, at least if you look at the international data, 
some countries have shown that it's possible to improve over time. Um, other countries have shown that it's possible to regress over time, but it's not uh, certain that uh, all learning is impervious to the policies of countries. So um, my own experiences that I'll give you a, a little hint of of what, how I would interpret these data or what we should do. Um, it's basically taking the COVID experiences and putting them in the place of historical policy options that I've argued for in the past, but now become more important, basically. That's, that's the argument I'm gonna make. Um, and there are two that I think are important. One is, using our effective teachers more intensively. Now, one of the things that we've had with all the hybrid learning and so forth is that we've had um, a lot of remote instruction where kids are sitting in their rooms in front of a computer screen um, and getting instruction over the screen. I think that what we're gonna find, I, we have no data on this yet, on, particularly on this last experience, but what we're gonna find is that some teachers are much better at remote instruction than others. That some teachers have figured out how to do it. Um, that obviously was the case in last March. And I think that mostly they weren't very good at it. The summer time was spent making sure we had technology and training, but I think we still get a lot of variation. What we knew before um, the pandemic was that there were huge variations in teacher effectiveness um, in general. Um, and in fact, they, uh, we've never been able to actually do much about that, but um, the estimates that I've done in the past that, that uh, are the most sensational in some sense are studying learning in Gary, Indiana, all poor, all black kids. And you walk down the hallway in a school and you look in one classroom and the kids on average learn a year and a half worth of material each academic year. And you look across the hallway at another classroom and you see that the kids in that classroom are learning half a year of material over an academic year. So that depending upon which classroom you were assigned to, you could end up with a full year difference in learning at the end of an academic year. Now, we've known that those differences exist for a long time. Every parent has seen it with their, the, their kids. Um, every teacher knows that those differences exist. Every principal knows, um, uh, but we've never been able to use that information to manage our schools. My own guess is that the people that are most effective remotely are not necessarily the ones that are most effective in person. That, that's kind of a guess, but if that's true, what it does suggest is that we might come out of this pandemic being able to um, use the remote instructors that are good at it uh, more intensively, give them more kids to work with, and use the ones that are particularly good at in-person instruction, use them with more kids, um, and use the pandemic to get to a point that we should have been at or could have been at before the pandemic of using teachers more effectively uh, when they're skilled uh, for the more skilled people. Rick, from what I know of online, it seems that um, wanting to pass the test is important and your own motivation is, is more important even for online than with the social pressures of classroom. So this would seem like a particularly bad year to have waived all grades and testing. Uh, as far as the effectiveness of online education. Do you have comments on that? Yeah, I think you're absolutely correct. And I, it's a particularly bad year not to have test, testing. There is some testing that's going on. And there's a federal law that insists that there is a fair amount of testing in schools. 
but the um I'm going to test for incentive, not test for data. I don't pay any attention to that Stanford uh, uh, training we have to do online unless I have to pass a test on it. <laughs> yes. Well, that's coming, John. Um, Can I ask uh, a, Rick, a quick question? Yeah. About how you think about the media policy on other non cognitive dimension of uh, learning in schools for very young children. No, I, th I think that um, this has got to be important. I mean, it's hard to imagine running kindergarten online. Um, and, it, you know, a large part of kindergarten is socialization and, and learning how to, how to behave in schools and so forth. I mean, I think one of the things that we've learned from all of our experiences with online instruction is that teachers are really important. Having teachers along participating in some manner with both providing feedback and providing motivation and so forth that's really important. And that becomes really uh, um, more critical, I think, at uh, early grades where we're doing a lot of that. It's probably at the college level, it's probably pretty critical for freshmen too, incoming freshmen that don't learn how to behave in colleges, uh, but are doing their instruction remotely. It's probably pretty important there too. But yeah, I mean, that, that, that's got to be important. I, I think that we're getting some information to suggest that social emotional learning and other things are important. Um, we don't quite have a good feel for how that's created in classrooms and the interaction of schools with social emotional learning and that sort of non-cognitive learning. Um, what we do know is that cognitive skills as measured by these tests is really important. And then there's probably some other things along the edge. Then back to Steve's um, point. Um, I think we've known for a long time that we should be doing more individualization of instruction that in any classroom, we end up with, in fact, um, a wide variation in the starting points. You know, at the starting point at fourth grade, you see wide differences in the math skills of the um, students coming in. And we, again, haven't done a lot with that, although we're starting to do more, have the technology to try to help in doing that. Um, I think as the students uh, look so much different, as the variation increases over this period of closures and hybrid learning, we're going to just have to go to more individualized instruction, which is, again, to me, an example of something we should have been doing before the pandemic, but the pandemic might help us to get to that point. And if we got to that point with in either using our effective teachers more intensively or individualizing instruction, we could actually think of improving the quality of our schools over what we had in January of 2019. So we could think of possibly making up for a portion of the learning loss by running our schools better. You mean by individualized? Uh, Rick, why, why do you think that that may be happening? I mean, given that we've been knowing that all along, why and then never learned how to do it, or where well, we did learn, but it's just there are no incentives to go there. Why should the pandemic push us to do these two things? Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is the feasibility. I mean, um, uh, <laughs> This is, these policies had limited traction before COVID. You can find some examples. Uh, Washington DC is a good example of using information about teacher effectiveness to actually make decisions in schools. Dallas, Texas and all of Texas now is. Um, the, there's been huge pushback and it's the, um, it's not only the teachers unions, although they've been extraordinarily important, but it's the whole 
structure of schools has resisted of administrators. So if you look in Texas, which is a right to work state, you still have the same resistance to in fact, uh, paying more attention to teacher effectiveness. <laughs> My so, hope. Hmm? Sorry, I was gonna say something good did happen in the pandemic. A lot of parents um, saw what the schools were involved and what the teachers union are doing and are up in arms about it. And um, you know that that might be the catalyst for change. That that is my hope. Over the, that the, my usual response is that over the last year, uh, parents have been looking over the shoulders of their kids who are getting various instruction, and they might not think it's up to what they thought or hoped it would be, and that in fact there is increased pressure of parents to in fact pay attention to what kids are learning. Um, there's certainly, um, it's possible uh, that the unions have overplayed their hand, um, that they have spent the last year arguing, well, in-class instruction is important, but we can't have a teacher go into a school where there is any risk of getting sick. Um, and in all of the discussion, if you pick up the New York Times regularly, which is perhaps a mistake, but if you pick it up regularly, you will in fact see very little discussion about what's happening to the kids. All of the discussion is about whether the, um, there's a transmission of uh, the virus through the kids to the adults. So uh, Rick, you talk about individualization here and, and it sounds like you want more digital online learning, uh, but I thought you said that one of the problems is that kids were learning online. So I'm just no, wondering no. why your recommendation is more use of online learning when you seem to have thought that's part of the problem that we had that this year. I think over the last year we've done worse with the online learning than we've had um, compared to what we might have expected with in-person instruction. Um, I think that, um, <clears throat> first, I think that as we go into the next school year, there's still going to be a fair amount of hybrid um, learning and a fair amount of online learning that still goes on. I mean, New York City is an example where we have full classrooms of kids that are looking at a screen because this, the teacher is home giving the lecture from their, their home. Um, now that's probably not gonna continue very much, but I think we're gonna have some parents that are reluctant to send their kids to school and we're gonna have more hybrid kind of learning. But you're we saying have, here we do have that you, you like Paul, it. Wait, 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 Paul, Paul, wait. We, we do, um, have some examples that are starting to develop that look like they are productive use of individualization with more remote learning com combined with in-person learning. The okay. summer learning example that was developed around here is a good example where they now have a pretty robust platform for online uh, sort of hybrid instruction where kids are learning at their own pace. There's a teacher involved, but they're also getting a lot of their learning online. I, I wanna, um, Rick, we're gonna end at 1.15, so I wanna make sure you get a chance to get through your last couple of slides. Okay, we're, not, we're almost done. <laughs> um, uh, the union throughout this whole period have taken the virus as an invitation to bargain. Um, Massachusetts, uh, where Paul spent some of his time is a good example that last March, as soon as the COVID example hit, they put out their recommendations for how schooling should go in the following year. And one of their recommendations was that we should end testing forever, end all standardized testing in Massachusetts schools forever, which had nothing obviously to do with the pandemic. Um, we had lots of contract changes in the spring, which were all designed to make life better for the teachers. 
And then if you just follow any of your local schools of Chicago or New York City or LA or San Francisco, you see that the unions have uh, been pushing all kinds of things quite unrelated to learning in the classroom. So let me conclude, all right? The economic losses have been ignored as far as I can tell, and they dwarf, absolutely dwarf all the short run costs of the pandemic experience. And um, they could support all of what Biden wants to do, at least in, in uh, present value terms. Um, we're still talking about what the school should look like, uh, what the condition should be. And to me, it's a growing disaster that, that, that the country is going to be really harmed if we can't mobilize John's parents and uh, the country's parents to in fact uh, lead to improving our schools. This generation has been significantly harmed and they're not going to just climb out of it on their own without some actions and the country has been harmed. That, that's what I have, right at, right at 1.15 according to my clock. <laughs> Perfectly done. Thank you so much, Rick. That was wonderful. Aludra, I, th I think we all need to have a glass of wine with these seminars. That looks like a great innovation. <laughs> uh, so thank you. Everybody. I counted 14 hours of solid work today before the seminar, so I just had to have it. You earned it. You earned it. <laughs> Us not yet. Okay, thank you, everybody. That was wonderful, and I'll see you next week.